Chapter 22 It was a quiet evening in the bar. As usual, the early evening hours had been packed with Yiga, wrapping their shifts on the outskirts of the castle. The king was a lot of things, but foolish enough to let those clowns too close to the castle's heart wasn't one of them. They'd spend a few hours daring each other to take too many shots of sweet, sticky laurel and rum, turning themselves sloppy and leaving patches of dried tar for her to scrape off later. The local high-ends knew to wait until they'd finished their early start before they filled in the spaces, sometimes so thickly she had to turn parties away. Unthinkable before the town was locked down, quickly flooded with new money and fresh imports, but all stifled within the tight circle of the immediate circle of town. Six months of house arrest had brought out the absurdity in her neighbors. The most restless among them had joined ranks with Hudson's swelling construction team or even the Great Plateau's reopened chasm, although she had a hard time wrapping her mind around the desperation to leave the streets of Newcastle town for the obliterating darkness of the depth. The young girls in town, Ellie's friends, the ones who used to traipse the roads of Hyrule in search of their favorite flowers and stable boys, now wore their new bonnets and gowns on any and all occasions they left the house, including stops into the dodgy well. The later evenings were starting to look like a royal reception, with silk and rubies hanging over the worn wood and frosted pitchers of ale, clamoring for attention. And then there was Ellie herself, glowering in the corners, sullen in a way that was the signature of her younger sister Karina but not the honey-tongued butterfly she'd watched volunteers the queen's maid before any of her friends had the chance to supersede her. Kara had begged Ellie to reconsider as she frantically threw her airy cotton skirts and blouses in her wicker flower basket, breathless over the fact that Princess, nay, Queen Zelda needed her right away. Ellie, we were, there, in the sanctum, Kara pleaded, pressing her palms together as if the goddess could intercede. The princess's situation is very fraught right now. That's why she needs me, Ellie said in her sing-song, heedless voice, snatching her freshest bundles of lavender to press between the linens. No one can help her through this as well as I can. You shouldn't be that close to that abomination of a Gerudo curse, she warned, trying to shift her daughter's focus, to scare her into reason. What kind of king takes his first moments on Hyrule's holy throne to impale an adversary? All the more reason that her highness needs someone who understands her. Another Hylian on her side. Kara shot forward, catching her child by the wrist. He's an evil man set on doing evil things. It's all he knows. There will be nothing that you can do to stop him, or help her. The fact that you are even imagining that you possibly could is alarming and childish. I raised smarter daughters than that. Ellie huffed, thinning away to tie her hair up in a robin's blue ribbon, contrasting beautifully against her curly red locks. Her heartbreakingly, effortlessly lovely girl. Her dumb, determined little lamb. I already promised the guards that I'd be there within the next hour. She reminded her mother. If you're so afraid of them all, do you really want me to go back on my promise and keep the new queen waiting? For months, the only hint given that her girl wasn't rotting down in the forgotten foundation were the flower-scented letters that would slip underneath the door overnight, raving in Ellie's looped script over how vivid the castle had become now, how brilliant and composed Zelda was up close, how intricate and delicious the palace meals were, even for the servants. In the bottom of the envelope a few red rupees would jangle, more a peace offering than anything else. That was until the space between the correspondence stretched, and her writing became more clipped, peppered with annoyances she couldn't hide, even with the buffer afforded by the pen. It's curious how some people sleep at night, she reported vaguely, or, I hope no one decides to forget about me and my heart and their own ambition. I'd sooner die than see it. Until the night Kara was awoken by relentless rapping on the dodgy well's entrance sending her catapulting out of bed, throwing the door open to find the two Verena guards who were seconds away from breaking it down, hauling a red-faced Ellie between them. The sight sent Kara's heart straight to the pit of her stomach. She'd never seen a Gerudo up close, let alone one of these fanatical warriors, wearing the identical black robes of their glorious leader. The shimmer smudged around their eyes set off even in the scant moonlight. The lower half of their faces were obscured by veils, making it tough to tell them apart, even a breath away. 
green eyes, high ponytails, slicked back red locks clasped by ruby clips worth more than their family had ever amassed. They held Ellie in an arm lock, which they dismantled at the handoff. Ellie's face was streaked with snot and tears, but aside from her pride, nothing seemed hurt. Your daughter's services will no longer be required. She should spend the rest of her days in the temple thanking the goddess that her king felt merciful. One of them made clear before turning in tandem with her partner, and vanishing around the corner bakery. After Ellie recounted the saga of her employment, Kara vibrated with rage. I do not know how, by what possible sort of grace, you weren't dropped off on our doorstep dead. She fumed. What were you thinking? Lying to the queen? For what purpose? I wasn't lying. Ellie sniffled rubbing away the slug trails on her face with her tattered sleeve. All of these improvements and endeavors are just a trick. No one would be going down into the depths if it weren't for that bastard and his army of whores. Ellie! Language! Kara groaned, sinking her face into her hands. Of course Karina was right behind the counter, rouse from bed, at those first piercing knocks. Is that the kind of talk they entertained at the castle? I didn't hear much talking, she said, crossing her arms as a furious pout swelled her lips. It was drowned out by all the moaning. Elizabeth, I thought you and Princess Zelda had so much in common. Karina cut in. She didn't want to be your best friend after all. She's a fake. She shot back. She was nothing like the princess we know. We never knew the princess, said Karina. You only knew what you read in the Gazette. You couldn't even be bothered to read a bound book about her life, just your dumb paragraphs. Enough, both of you, Kara had insisted. Karina, back to bed. Now, Ellie, wash your face and get some water. I'll make sure you have your room ready for when you're finished. We can talk more about this in the morning. But they hadn't talked. Not in the wake of the castle bell tolling. The shouts of hide, the menace is dead, lobbed from the guardhouses to the gates, to the square and streets of town, shaking Hyrule away. Link was gone. Karina begged to go into the square and watch the pyre. If I don't see it, maybe I won't remember what really happened. She tried to explain. The teacher at her school had confiscated her compendium, along with all the other history books and novels that used to bulge from the classroom's shelves. These all are going into review, they were told, months ago. Karina had read the write-up in the Gazette of the Coronation she'd watched, not far from where Tolin and his family stood, the Rito youth suddenly thrust onto the precipice of submitting or dying. she watched the distress and shock cleansed off the record, the spilled blood cleansed into a celebration. The stunned princess and her ultimatum warped into a new love story for the ages. How quickly she'd learned to trust nothing. Ellie, wisely for once, had refused to accompany them. Hylia is merciful, she mumbled, if she spared Link from discovering who Zelda really is. What did Ellie expect Zelda to do? Carnea asked as they filed out onto the cobblestones, each wearing simple navy skirts, Karenna in her starched, felt jacket with gold filigree embroidery, fitted smartly with darts at the waist. It was a splurge when Kara saw it in the shop, a gift to cheer up the daughter who'd stayed at home and lost what she loved the most. The new outfit was stitched together hope, the best consolation she knew how to offer. Kara stuck with a cream-colored blouse that was faded but clean. With the influx of business, she hadn't had time to shop for herself. You know your sister is very... literal, Kara said, squeezing the girl's hand. Their little private reminder for being out in public. Don't say anything you wouldn't want the king to overhear. To her, I'm sure reckless defiance of the situation would seem romantic, rather than suicidal. The guards had prepared the bales of straw and kindling next to the central square fountain, which had already swelled with people in various states of confusion. No one seemed quite sure how to hold their faces or their bodies. It was a less jarring unease than what festered in the castle during the coronation, as living underneath the nose of the enemy had, in the past six months, knitted into the fabric of their everyday existence. No black, she noted while scanning the crowd. 
The people of Newcastle Town learned quickly. Kara? A familiar voice called from behind her, and she turned to see Abigail, who ran the Wildberry Bakery down the street. The two women had known each other since childhood, but rarely crossed paths. Abigail and her husband were waking up to start muffins and loaves when Kara was orchestrating last last call for her stragglers. Abigail. She squeezed her hands, keeping a tight control on her smile in these tense circumstances. You remember Karina, don't you? The little baby from Lookout Landing. She gasped. Look at you all grown up. What about Ellie? She used to come in for cupcakes quite a bit, but it's been a while. Maybe since then. Ellie is back at home again. Kara cut in. But she wasn't feeling well today. Such a day, Abigail said, her voice strained, unsure which direction it should land. Such a day, Kara repeated. It had been too long since they'd spoken, much too long since they'd been close. No way to tell where the others' allegiances fell. Hylia works in mysterious ways, decided Abigail. She does indeed, said Kara. The castle bell resonated once more, and from the crest of the castle gates, a procession began to move. The black Gerudo steeds and Verena guard made their way down the slope that dipped into the heart of town. In the middle, four guards hoisted a body laid upon a wooden stretcher. The king followed behind the grim parade, conspicuously alone. As the cavalcade drew near the crowd parted, watching in silence as the hero was carried between them, everyone catching their last glimpse of what had once been their only hope. The sight of the blood-soaked champion blue made a lump rise up in Kara's throat, one she had to immediately swallow back, bury with all the terror and uncertainty she felt in this strange, orderly monster's world, in the shadow of his fortress, in service of a reign that could very well last the rest of her life. Mom? Karina murmured, tugging on Kara's blouse sleeve, pulling her back to the sight of Ganondorf solemnly passing by, the crowd so hushed they could hear the chafe of silk from his scarves. Something's not right. Zelda isn't here. Kara pulled back to stare into the child's unwavering, factual calm. Darling, she whispered, we say the queen such company, and this is probably a very emotional day for her. So we need to stop our speculating, right now. If the king had actually won, she said softly, she would have come. Kara didn't have time to sort out the riddle of Karina's logic before swooping down to her eye level, grasping her shoulders for dear life. That is a very dangerous thing to be saying so close to a very dangerous man, she said faintly. Whatever wisdom fueled Korean's reason also fed her self-preservation, and the girl's face set to stone. Such a strange conclusion, Kara realized in her hazy recollection, one that she'd yet to follow up on in the ensuing weeks. Weeks that rolled with an anxious rhythm to move forward and away from the town's confinement, to branch back out into Hyrule Field and its chains of villages and towns, even as frost tinged the leaves and snow crept further down the mountainsides. As people began picking up those cursed pint glasses they'd been saddled with, either as some show of fealty they could broadcast over their own dining tables, or the occasional comment left with the purchase, I don't know, there was always something shifty about his story. All that hard work to get close to the princess and power, it kind of makes sense now, doesn't it? Why else would anyone put themselves through so much with so little reward? No one has that much selfless goodness in their hearts. I'll tell you that much. Not for nothing. Karina, Kara said in the empty bar, calling over to her daughter, who'd cheated bedtime by insisting she had to finish the paper's crossword before she could brush her teeth. Remember what you said about the queen, about how she wasn't at the, um, funeral. Didn't you read the Gazette? Karina said ruefully. She was so overcome with trauma she couldn't stand up straight. What did you mean by that? What you said that day? Karina craned her head around the bar, until she was certain her only possible threat was enchanted spiders in the dusty rafters. If Zelda believed there was no way Ganondorf could be defeated and sealed away, she wouldn't have just let him go and torch the hero while she hid up in the castle, no matter how upset she was. Why not? Kara leaned in closer 
a child over a campfire. Because he was her last hope. She'd need to see him totally, completely destroyed with her own eyes to be sure it was truly gone. She took a breath, leading her mother patiently to the bridge. If she's willing to let him go that easily, she's got to be holding on to something else. All truths suspect, absolute's a trick for lazy minds. This was the high rule Karina had steeped in, from her first steps teetering in lookout landing to the shell of a castle forming the vista of her childhood. The legends of Sheikah tricks and contradicting legends overlapping each other. Had the ancient hero of time truly died, or slipped into an alternate realm? Why did the Zone disappear? Why did all of the Sheikah technology refined for the calamity simply vanish? Where did the upheaval shrines come from? Her young mind was molded in this flexible reality with its ephemeral certainties. Seeing the truth for herself was the only way she could stay sane. Care considered as she pinched her lips, tossing the theory around in her mind. The queen hasn't been spotted by anyone outside the castle in the weeks since. She pointed out. What's not to say that once Link was defeated, the king had no more use for his bait, and had her secretly executed? No, she said, immediately shaking her head. He still needs her. For what? The squawk of the ancient door hinge sent them both to the ceiling as two enormous Rito archers, each cradling a teetering Hylian girl in her newest, clingy brocade dress frilled with bows and lace like an ice layer cake, stifling giggles into their plumage. Are you still open? The most sober representative wanted to know. Absolutely, Kara said, feigning a grin. Please, have a seat. Oh my goddess, they have the you. Glasses. Here. One of the girls squealed, plucking a pint from the counter and immediately watching as it slid through her lucid fingertips, shattering on the worn-away brick. That's all right. Don't worry about it. She assured her as Karina leapt out for the broom. One less curse to float in the kingdom. I'll get you all some water. End of chapter 